in Daiwan. The West African state of Liberia was founded by the American Colonization Society in 1822 and declared independent in 1847. However, due to the predation of different colonial powers, the fledgling state was left with severe debt. In response, Marcus Garvey, UNIA ACL, proposed a viable program that would not only clear the debt, but also develop the country into a regional powerhouse. Unfortunately, this plan was scuppered by a combination of subterfuge, corruption, and cowardice. And the land promised to the UNIA ACL was given to the Firestone Rubber Company in 1926 in a 99-year lease. The 26 lease effectively elevated Firestone to the dictatorship within the country where it controlled the economic lessons of the government by the workers in their free flight conditions, utilized child labor, looted the land, practices we've seen spread throughout the continent ever since. For their part, Firestone say they've driven the economic development while paying the highest wages in the country. Nevertheless, they've also been accused of a duplicitous role in the country's conflict, most notoriously with warlord and president Charles Taylor, which again is <laughs> unbeknownst. In 2009, 99-year lease was extended for another 36 years until 2045. Firestone officials claim the extension demonstrates a commitment to help rebuild Liberia. Critics say that Firestone has functioned as a nation within a nation for its own benefit and it should have been turned over to the Liberian government at the end of the original term in 2025. Firestone has had almost a century to help build Liberia, let alone rebuild it. Surely the Liberians, indeed Africans, must, must rue the missed opportunity <laughs> by the Garvey movement back in the 1920s. So tonight, sisters and brothers, we ask the question, what is Firestone's legacy in Liberia? How has Liberia benefited from Firestone's presence? Would the UNIA ACL program have been more beneficial? Is Firestone committed to building Liberia? Should Firestone be turned over to the Liberian government? A special guest is brother, you already heard from Brother Lida Bandaka, who will be joining us again shortly. But we welcome to the first time, sister and brother, Sister Cal Branbule. She was born in the USA of Liberian heritage and has undertaken several high-level government and non-government roles in Liberia, where she now resides. Using her background in public policy and statistics, Sister Cal has been a social and political activist since the age of 14 and is also a trained archival researcher and student of Liberian and African world history. She shares her findings on her FOL podcast titled the Liberia History Channel. Sister Cal is the devoted wife of Bakai Fanbula and a proud mother of four children, Ashe, Nasir, Adama, and Naima. Sister and brother, for the full synopsis, go to alkeblon.org. The lines are not open right now, sister and brother, but you can certainly text or WhatsApp in on 07947-479-219 at plus four four if you're texting or WhatsApp in from abroad. Tendai Mwari. Tendai Mwari, brothers and sisters, we're going to get right into it. And first of all, let me just greet our sister, Kao. Greetings. Hello. Good Good day, everyone. Good evening in, in the UK there. We're hearing you, but we're hearing you very low, and I'm, I'm relatively sure that it's not you so i'm gonna try and okay maybe it is i can hear you just fine so all technicals are, are resolved welcome uh sister cow we, we appreciate thank you your um and you are in liberia right now uh, uh, am i correct no actually i'm in mean, i'm in georgia in the united states um okay. right now okay all right well welcome either way we appreciate your presence and so First and foremost, oh, by the way, just to clarify and, and confirm, the, the FOL in, in your bio is focused on Liberia, correct? That is correct. Yep, and so I was, I was just letting brothers and sisters know while you were uh, returning to us to check out the YouTube channel, um, and, you know, because it's very informative. And I do believe I've seen you there once or twice myself, so. Uh, Great. Thanks. So we're, t we're focusing today on the history of, La of Firestone uh, Rubber Company in Liberia, yeah? Now, as you know, it's the month of Messiah. We're celebrating the legacy of Marcus Messiah Garvey. So we're going to contextualize it within that context shortly. But first and foremost, yeah, from your information, understanding, and knowledge, yeah, just give our listeners an understanding of how Firestone comes to be in Liberia in the first place. This is a, a great question. So... Hmm. 
we have to, if you don't mind, I just want to make a couple of corrections about Liberian history. Mm -hmm. uh, the Republic of Liberia was not established by the American Colonization Society. In fact, um, that is probably one of the greatest misnomers about Liberian history. Uh, Liberia was established, um, the Republic of Liberia was established through the self-determination of, of, of descendants of Africa. Mm -hmm. And that needs to always be men like Elijah Johnson, Hillary Teague, these people who were courageous um, and stood in defense of African people uh, in the face of, of global white supremacy, they need to be remembered. And a lot of times when we give credit to Europeans for the accomplishments of Africans, we erase, we erase our deeds from history. Mm -hmm. So Liberia is not something that happened to African people. It's something African people created. Mm -hmm. uh, and understanding that will lead us to understand why and how the United States government came to annex, economically annex Liberia. So Firestone is the economic annexation of the sovereign republic of Liberia. Mm -hmm. So before Firestone, though there were economic embargoes and trade sanctions against Liberia for reasons, um, because basically Africa at the time was colonized and Liberia stood as an affront to colonization, Firestone, the effort to bring Firestone into Liberia was the United States government assisting a, an American corporation with economically conquering this sovereign state. Mm -hmm. And it did not happen without a huge fight. So one of the greatest misnomers or misunderstandings is that Liberia just somehow gracefully accepted Firestone and the economic annexation of the Republic. This did not happen. In fact, many Liberians died or mysteriously disappeared and all kinds of things happened in order to make sure that this could happen. Right. So I can talk about that a little bit if you'd like, or I mean, I hope that answers the question. So Firestone's coming into Liberia was not um, at the will of those torchbearers of Liberia sovereignty. Men like James J. Dawson, Arthur Barclay, um, the grandson of Elijah Johnson, who I consider to be the founder of Liberia sovereignty, um, Hillary R. Johnson. These were members of the UNIA. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I always like to remind people when we talk about Garvey, when we talk about Marcus Messiah Garvey, before Marcus Messiah Garvey, there was Elijah Johnson. Before Marcus and Messiah Garvey, there was Joseph Jenkins Roberts going to the Caribbean and telling African people, come home. We have established an independent republic. Mm -hmm. Barbados had a back to Africa movement. Barbados had a back to Africa movement before Garvey was born. Garvey did not come out of thin air. Garvey is the result of a legacy, just as you are, just as I am. So Messiah looked to Liberia because that is where some of these men that he had studied came from. And he understood the history. Not the history as it's been told by white supremacy, but the history that actually was, mm -hmm. which is this, self, this, this desire for African self-determination. Liberia was an island of, of courage and an ocean of tyranny and fear for many generations. The story of Firestone talks about how this spirit of self-determination and African economic prosperity was sabotaged. Mm -hmm. Firestone, at the time that Firestone uh, was, was, had determined that we're going to use Liberia as a, as a, uh, basically as a giant plantation mm -hmm. for this American corporation. Mm -hmm. There had been about 30 years of an economic embargo against the Republic of Liberia. After the Berlin Conference, yeah. after the Berlin Conference, they had 
basically determined that Africans could not take care of themselves. They needed to be uh, be under the custodial guardianship of some European power. Yeah. Well, two places stood as an affront to this, Liberia and Ethiopia. Mm-hmm. So how do you justify colonizing Africa when you have Africans on the West Coast living self-determinant lives, trading, creating schools, creating businesses, and being prosperous? Mm-hmm. Well, we'll stop trading with them. They started inciting internal conflicts, doing the things that they do continuously throughout our history, mm-hmm. uh, trying to cause issues so that the country could implode on itself so that they could eventually take it over. Right. Brilliantly and masterfully, many of these leaders, Arthur Barkley from Barbados uh, and many others, su- subsequently Daniel Edward Howard and other great, great leaders had resisted this. Mm-hmm. This this information that I'm providing is something that you will not just see in most books or narratives written about Liberia. Yeah. Because the 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 idea being that they were more concerned about, of course, you want to hide this kind of thing because. You can't explain to the African world that for over a century, you had this pocket of African people from all around the world living and creating a state. This is the epitome of Pan-Africanism. There's a reason Garvey was drawn there. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a fool. He understood that this was what Liberia was established for. James J. Dawson, who was the Supreme Court Justice of Liberia at the time that UNIA had the agreement to go back, was the head of UNIA in Liberia. James J. James J. Dawson was also the vice president to Arthur Barclay. Mm-hmm. He was the first indigenous vice president of Liberia. He was also the first indigenous Supreme Court Justice of Liberia. Mm-hmm. And he was a staunch Pan-Africanist. Um, I'll, I'll pause there. I don't want to keep running on. I know this is not a, a monologue, but I just wanted to give a, a kind of oversight. Give, give thanks, my sister. We, and, and we know that there's a whole heap of complexities in there. So, uh, you know, so we, we appreciate mm-hmm. it. Don't throw no way. And, and be assured that we celebrate all of those that preceded uh, Papa Garvey as much as we, you know, hail Marcus Garvey himself for the work that he did in consolidating a lot of their work. Yeah. Um, another I another see. luminary. Uh, who was in, who Papa Garvey was inspired by, who spent some time in Liberia, but more time in Sierra Leone, uh, is uh, Baba Edward Wilmot Blyden. Yeah, yes. uh, also. So let's, 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 let's sort of call that name. So we get to the 19, um, so that we're, we're going to fast forward slightly now. Let's get to the 1920s, yeah. Um, and the fact that, like you said, the American government sends uh, Harvey Firestone, who is in fact the patriarch of the Firestone family. Um, and the head of the Firestone Rubber Company to Liberia, yes? And so yes. This, right. so it, this, this, this uh, relationship uh, ends up with Firestone being granted uh, a lease, a 99-year lease, yeah? Um, yes. Now, we're, we're going to get to the lease in a second, but just discuss the relationship between the UNIA. Well, what, what work, from your understanding, was the UNIA developing in Liberia, and what was their relationship with the Liberian government in general and President uh, Charles King in particular? So the UNIA, the UNIA is essentially the ideology of the UNIA is essentially the, the fabric of which Liberia was woven. Mm-hmm. In 1847, when Liberia created a constitution, Liberia, Liberia determined that. that I'm sorry, I'm hearing feedback. Is that on my end? No, it's not. It, it probably okay. isn't. But so the UNIA essentially... Um, it might be, you know, but we'll, we'll, try and, we'll try and do something here to, to remedy. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, so... Go ahead. I'll just, I'll just try my best to ignore it. <laughs> so the, U, the UNIA essentially has the same ideology as Liberia. In 1847, when Liberia was created... The idea was it was created as an asylum for free Africans. Liberia is the only country on the planet to this day where you have to be black to be a citizen. Liberia is the only country to this day where every inch of its territory is still fully owned by Africans. That is one of the last things we're able to hold on to. Uh, 
UNIA being established in Liberia was natural because most of the men of that generation grew up with this idea of Pan-Africanism. And in fact, Liberia was the home to African-Americans, Caribbean-Americans, uh, liberated captives who were rescued from slave ships, indigenous people from the vicinity who had escaped the tyranny of war and conflict with other ethnic groups, people who had escaped um, uh, uh, the tyranny of the French forces from the Wosulu Empire when it collapsed, when, when uh, uh, Samori Toure's empire collapsed. Many of his members of his empires descended into Liberia for refuge. So Liberia in its nature is a combination of Africans from all over the world and from within the region who came together to create this republic. So UNIA was natural. This is what the whole point of the country was. Charles D.B. King was the son, contrary to what most people say, they think Charles D.B. King was an African-American descendant. He was not. Charles D.B. King, Charles D.B. King was the son of a recaptured African. A recaptured African is a person who is liberated from a ship, not having reached um, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the so-called new world and, and, and had experienced actual slavery. So he was liberated, sent to Sierra Leone as a child from a slave ship. Charles D.B. King then, as he was educated and grew up, went to Liberia seeking opportunity. Charles D.B. King's father, C.T.O. King, sorry, seeking opportunity. When C.T.O. King had his son, his son was raised in these missionary schools. His son was raised as a Christian. Charles was raised with a lot of privilege because his father was extremely successful. So Charles D.B. King, his mindset was not necessarily in line with his predecessors, Daniel Edward Howard, Arthur Barclay, and many of the men who came before him who were staunch, determined Africanists. Charles was very different. His mindset was the soft life. We can't beat these people, but what can I do to benefit myself? We can't destroy these people. We don't, in his mind, he was already defeated. There was no reason for Liberia to continue suffering generation upon generation, fighting a giant that they cannot conquer, in his mind, of course. You know, the mind of cowardice is what I usually say. Cowards always find excuses to betray the struggle and take the easy road out, as they think. And so Charles was also one of these people who um, did not like uh, the idea of um, hardship. He wanted to have the finer things in life. I can't overemphasize this because this, this, this greed, this materialism is usually what is used to manipulate leaders into doing things against the interest of their fellow citizens. Uh, so Charles, you know, hanging out with Harvey Firestone Jr. And, and, and being, you know, wined and dined, and he himself having grown up in relative privilege, uh, really looked at this thing as more of a class struggle. And he saw himself and identified himself as, as, as an elite person. He didn't identify himself with the rest of African people. And he, clearly repeated this throughout speeches in the way that he positioned himself. He really didn't think that he, ident he didn't identify himself with the greater masses. It made it easier for him, I think, to welcome Firestone in. Well, uh, and I'll, I'll pause there, but, but Charles was, was not, Charles E. King, President King was not uh, a Pan-Africanist. He was not um, in favor of he, he made an a infamous statement that he was not the president of all African people, that he was only the president of Liberia. I mean, that's basically him in a nutshell. Every single one of his predecessors said the exact opposite. Right, right. Every president that preceded him said the exact opposite. He was the first Liberian president to say, no, Liberia isn't what it was established to be. This is a country in and of itself, and we're not responsible for other African people. This was a new ideology. This is not the historic uh, mantra of the Liberian Republic. Mm -hmm. So, but we know that um, 
Okay, you, you yeah, good, thanks. Just, I just wanted to clarify because you mentioned about Charles King, and I think this is something which we're not clear about because when you look at the negotiations with the UNA ACL, it seemed to be initially even he was favourable to the program that had been proposed. We know the likes of JJ Dawson were always in favour of what was being proposed. Now, some people say he was never in favour and that played along for a certain. Firestone, for those who don't know, is the world's largest rubber company, yeah. well known for making tyres, um, but also various rubber projects, rubber products, and they uh, were established um, in the year 1926. But our sister is back with us. Didn't you have the question, my sister? I, I heard most of it. You were asking if he played on. So Charles D.B. King served in the administration of previous president, administrations of previous presidents. Mm -hmm. And the way Liberia worked at the time is that everyone has to be in line with the leader. Mm -hmm. So if you are a foreign yeah, minister or whatever yeah. position you serve, you have to speak the thoughts and the vision of the leader. So Charles initially had no choice. His, his thoughts and his words were that of the administration, not his own. And you don't get to see who he is until he himself is a leader. Right. Give thanks. So if you're under under Barclay and Barclay, which was a staunch Africanist, stood up against European imperialism to the day he died. If Arthur Barclay is your is your boss, you don't go and, and, and speak your mind. You speak Barclay's mind. That's that's, that's good because that, that's something we were unclear about. Yeah. So. so so we, you know, these guys were, were government officials. I've served in government, even in modern times. I could, I could dare not go anywhere and say something that President Sirleaf did not agree with. It doesn't, it's just not how it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You either, you either go and you represent, you know, the, the mantra of your leader, or you don't go at all. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to ask you, um, uh, well, one, one last question specifically on the UNIA ACL in Liberia. And we're going to go on from the history in terms of lease and then post um, the lease up until we're going to bring it right up into the present. Okay. In terms of okay. Liberia, all right. So um, just from, from your understanding of the history, what was um, the, the relationship of the UNIA ACL with the people in Liberia? So outside of the government now, among the people of Liberia, what work was the UNIA ACL doing? This, this, what was the relationship with the people in Liberia? This is a great question. I am of the understanding that the majority of Liberians, mm -hmm. uh, especially those living in the coastal cities, mm -hmm. were very excited and welcoming mm -hmm. of the UNIA. When they had this huge movement of people from Barbados to Liberia, which Arthur Barclay was, was President Barclay and, and his nephew, Edwin Barclay, were descendants of that, those people. Barclay, Arthur himself came over on the ship, but Liberians still had this affinity with Caribbean people. And they were ho hoping that God would bring more people even from Jamaica and all these things. When you read some of the letters and the um, comments, it's that they felt that the people uh, that would be coming with UNIA were going to be productive and they were also going to be um, more culturally like Liberians. Okay. And so people, you know, you had the descendants of the, the, the people from Barbados and other areas uh, that were very excited. It is not possible for me to say, you know, what percentage of the population that was never measured by anyone. I'm only going by, you know, individual citizens, clergy people, 
preachers even who were very, very excited about about UNIA and, and, and prospects of even more people coming to help to grow the economy. Because you have to remember at this time, Liberians were, were producing things for themselves. We had massive farms. We're producing sugar. We're producing rice. And we're producing, we're feeding ourselves at this point. People forget that before Firestone, Liberia was feeding itself. Uh, so people were excited. They were thinking that this was going to help even make the country more prosperous. But the, and the Liberian legislature is another important thing that people leave out. The Liberian legislature was comprised of very wealthy farmers and merchants. These wealthy farmers and merchants did not want to see the country economically annexed. De Bois wrote an article where he accused the United States government of wanting to install a dictator and basically uh, remove this independent legislature that was keeping presidents in check. When Du Bois wrote this, you know, people kind of overlooked it because this was before you have, you know, the later years you have Tudman come in. But if you really look at it, by the time Tudman comes in, the independent legislature of Liberia is removed. And almost everyone who becomes a lawmaker under Tudman's time is pretty much handpicked. And the whole process of democracy is sabotaged. But these were some of the things that were preventing Liberia's economic annexation previously is that the people who made the laws and who stood as gatekeepers for the country were 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 invested in the country's economic independence. Okay. You remove them and you put puppets in place, you can do what you want. Mm -hmm. And I also want to point out that this removal of these powerful gatekeepers that were protecting the state did not happen kind of quietly. It was blatant. Gabriel Johnson, for example, uh, who was the, the 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 grandson of Elijah Johnson? He was forced to resign from government, and he was sent to the island of Fernando Po, which is now called Biko Island, uh, off of the coast of of Angola. He was sent to Fernando Po to be an ambassador to the Spanish colony. Just a ridiculous, almost like a, a, a banishment. This was a, a, a hardcore supporter of UNIA. These are the people who were softening the ground for Garvey's landing. Robert Lincoln Poston, Garvey's closest advisor, died mysteriously while returning to the United States from Liberia. Cause of death unknown. This is all happening within the same 60-day period. Milton J. Marshall, head of Liberian UNIA, was shot by an unknown assailant in the city of Monrovia within the same 60-day period. And then Chief Justice James J. Dawson dies mysteriously in Cape Palmas on August 30th, 1924. So all these people who were softening the ground for UNIA's landing, they all died within 60 days. Well, wasn't um, Gabriel Johnson, he was, he was elected extreme potentate, potentate of the UNA, wasn't yeah, he? he? So was yeah. The potentate. Um, yeah. So, so it, uh, just, just to explain, family, the... Uh, at the 1920 convention of the Negro, people, the Negro peoples of the world, it was a government in exile was elected, yeah? And uh, it was designated by constitution that the potentate who serves um, ceremonially over the president general has to reside on the African continent. And uh, Gabriel Johnson was elected yes. first. Um, Thank you for pointing that, yes. Was, was he mayor of Monrovia? At mayor the time? of Monrovia at the same time as well. He yeah. was mayor of Monrovia, that's correct. And they they made him resign from his post. And he was then. So Charles E.B. King didn't want Gabriel Johnson killed. Yeah. 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 Oh. So his role, his thing now was just let's banish him. Get him out of the way, yeah. Understood. You, you, you've, you've run down some, some very important history, my sister, in terms of what was happening in that 1924 period, yeah? And so we're going to go forward from there now. And as we do so, let me just explain to our listeners that this period is extremely important. In 1924, the UNIA-ACL sends two delegations to Liberia, uh, upon the second, and, and one, of which, one of which was sent with over $50,000 worth of agricultural 
and industrial equipment and a, a, a team of uh, engineers and experts, yeah? Some of which are listed um, and, and pictured in philosophies and opinions of Marcus Garvey, okay? Um, and so the, the, the delegation lands, the second one, which I believe is in August, Messiah of that year, um, and they um, are not allowed, yeah, to disembark the ship. Uh, the goods that they have are seized, and eventually they're sold off, yeah, to various uh, groups of people. And also during um, this year, uh, Harvey Firestone travels to Liberia yes. to begin negotiations on the land, yeah. So I'm just pointing that out to situate this particular point in history for the audience. And our sister Cow has just given you a history in terms of. Uh, people being exiled effectively from the nation and others who are being killed off yeah, on the ground um, and their relationship with the UNIA ACL and this nation building project that, they, that, that is being instituted in Liberia along with forces in Liberia, yeah, um, you know, at, at this time, okay? And so Harvey Firestone arrives, yeah, negotiation with the uh, Liberian government. Sorry, I should say, Harvey Firestone arrives with representatives of the American government. Yes. Including, but, including a special representative. It's, including a special representative who was mentioned earlier um, by the name of W.E.B. Du Bois. Okay, so he's a part of this, this conversation that is, that, is, that is going on. Okay? Exactly. Right. Then now, the result of this, as we read in this book, is that in 1926, a lease, a 99-year lease is granted to Firestone. And how many millions of acres of land was it, my sister? So it's, it was actually supposed to be 1 million hectares right. of land. Mm -hmm. uh, and most of it was continuous uh, rainforest. So the, the way that the land worked in Liberia is that, uh, and this is very unique. This is why when people say Liberia is some kind of settler regime or some kind of colony, I think it's not. The, the constitution of Liberia is the only uh, Western style government that recognized the rights of indigenous people to own land, clearly because it was established by other African people. Mm -hmm. So most of the land in Liberia to this day is in the hands and in the control of indigenous people. The land that they were giving to Firestone was land that chiefdoms had already agreed to give to Garvey. Mm -hmm. They had already agreed to give to Garvey. For us, there was Pause there for a second, just just, just for because you you said something that maybe people don't often uh, uh, pick out, right? You said that chieftaincy. So this is local community groups that were in communication with the. So this is beyond just the government now. We're talking about local, like you know, indigenous, as you said, chieftaincies, yeah, that have been in the, developing this relationship with the UNIA ACL and the, right. and the government under King has come and basically shattered those agreements and brought Firestone into the team. Right. So you had at the time what was called Gibi territory. Right. It was Gibi territory and it was semi-autonomous. Okay. Uh, that doesn't mean it was not part of Liberia. That means that Gibi territory within Liberia was still somewhat self-governing. Yes, yes. Okay. And the Gibi people were willing to have UNIA come right. and set up their organization and orchestrate this yeah. you know, development project they were bringing and, you know, so this exact land, which was extremely fertile, virgin rainforest, really, mm -hmm. uh, then is, is given to Firestone in a 99 year lease, along with other areas of Liberia, parts of Maryland, the Jedetabo people in Maryland had given land for, for UNIA because of J.J. Dosen, he was born in Maryland County, Liberia. Right. So the Jidatabo land chiefdom had given land for UNIA because they respected J.J. Dosen and his request. Okay. They then turn around and give even that to Firestone. Right. So it was very, very uh, a blatant attack on uh, even just the founding principles of the, of the country and what the citizens of the country wanted. Yeah. Understood. And so um, it was six six cents per acre, sorry, per hectare, if, if my memory recalls correctly. Yeah, they, they say acre in a lot of the documents, but what I'm seeing is it's, it was really hectares of land. Right. Okay. Understood. All right. So, the, the, and by the way, so that's just dirt cheap. Yeah. It's like 
ridiculous. It's, it's basically free, right? Um, yes. Land that, that Firestone was given. So, and you said that this um, land was, most of it was continuous rainforest. Yeah? Right. Okay, so how did Firestone, because I'm sure they would have to, how did they get access to be able to extract, basically what they were trying to extract was rubber. How would they yes. get access? Try to extract the rubber from the land. So, so there, it wasn't even extraction yet. At this point, it's virgin rainforest. You've got these old, you know, ancient trees. You've got people's villages and towns and sacred rainforest. You know, all kinds of. This is not when I say virgin rainforest. What I mean is that these it was it was ancient, a uh, uh, land. Mm -hmm. Not that it wasn't being used. Mm. So Firestone comes in, there's two things the United States government does. Liberia had a very weak military. They had been broken and attacked on so many levels. You know, and I talked about the economic embargo. So they come in and say, okay, we'll, we'll help boost your military team. We're going to help support your military apparatus. And they come in and they arm, heavily arm, and they have this agreement to train Liberia's frontier forces. Now, African militaries are not created. Initially, Liberia's military was created to defend Liberia. But this is the point where you have an African military being trained not to defend the country, but to defend the economic interests of the United States. Yeah. So now you've got the military. Mm -hmm. They're going to come in and they're going to forcibly extract labor from these various clans throughout the Republic. Mm -hmm. There's a prelude to this. There's the whole Fernando Po labor crisis, which was just basically a big scam because what they didn't want was exported labor because they wanted to use the forced labor at Firestone. Yeah, yeah. So I want, if nothing comes out of this discussion, it needs to be understood that it was forced labor people's bare hands and crude, crude tools that cleared all of that land mm. to make way for the plantation. Mm -hmm. This was a mechanized farming. And at the time that Firestone Plantation was erected in the rainforest of Liberia with the bare hands of human beings, mm. it was the largest plantation in human history. Mm. I want you, I want you just rest with that king's hand. I want you just take you where this is to just say a while ago, you know. We're, we're talking about 400, five, 300 and something years of enslavement has already taken place by this point. Yes? And by the time Firestone cleared the rainforest, it is the largest plantation in human history. Yeah? And when we say colonization was nothing but slavery under another name people think that we are exaggerating mm -hmm. this is what we are talking about mm -hmm. yeah this is what we're talking about family and I, and, I, and I want you to overstand and just rest with what our sister has just said the largest plantation in human history over a million some say hectares some say acres of land cleared by indigenous africans yeah i'm talking about when i say indigenous I'm about any and, and and when we say forced labor we're talking about forced labor labor yeah so later on, they employ people and have some semblance of, of employment. But initially, mm -hmm. there was not a choice. Mm -hmm. You had to give so many people. And a lot of the, the leaders in our, our traditional kings, our traditional rulers are saying, no, mm. who's going to who's gonna farm? Yeah. Who's yeah. going to do our work? Yeah. Who's going to produce the food? If you take all of these able-bodied people, yeah. at the same time, they had a road project going on. The Liberian government had established initially under Daniel, President Daniel Howard, which was to pay, uh, not pay, but to to uh, uh, put a road through the rainforest going up into the interior of Liberia. That road still exists. It's been paved now, but they had a lot of workers working on that road for the government and they had to take those people off the road project. Yes. And then there was a labor crisis in the country because every able-bodied person was being forced to clear the rainforest, including women and children. Mm. Mm -hmm. In 1926, when the Harvard Medical Expedition went to go do their experiments on our people in Liberia, mm -hmm. 
this was all corresponding because they wanted to, a uh, Harvard University wanted to come and do research also to soften the ground for Firestone simultaneously. Many horrible things were happening. Yes, yes, yes. They went in and, and they needed porters. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you all are aware of what porters are in Africa, the people that carry things. Mm -hmm. And so when these Europeans, these, they come into to Africa and they need to go into the interior and they need to explore, they need to get these human beings to act as mules or oxes or horses, yeah. carry their loads and carry their own bodies physically in hammocks. Mm -hmm. There is video footage from 1926 of Harvard Expedition during the same time period, literally having pregnant women carry their load because no one else was left in the villages. Mm -hmm. The only people who were left in the villages mm -hmm. when they went and needed porters from town to town were pregnant women and old people. Mm. Mm. And I'll send you some of that footage afterwards, brother. But yes. it it is it was it was a time when the men had been sent into the rainforest and, and, and women who were not pregnant even and children who were able to yes. go clear this rainforest. Yes. yes. And Charles D.B. King, mm -hmm. the president, was witnessing this. This was a time of horror. Mm -hmm for the Liberian people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the oral tradition of our people, when you hear our old people talk, our grandmothers, they will say, and they say it in various dialects, but they call it Charlie King's time. They, they call Charles D.B. King's Charlie King's time. When in Liberia, when they say Charlie King's time, this is a time of tremendous hardship for our people. Right, right, right. Whenever you go to a village and they say, God, we have not suffered like this since Charlie King's time. This is what they're referencing. You ask anyone you know from Liberia, have you ever heard your grandmother or grandfather say Charlie King's time? It's an ominous time. It brings forth horrible memories. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, sis. You're, you're breaking it down very well. Let me let me ask you, um, was there, is there any noted resistance of our people on the ground at this time? Absolutely. Uh, what I will say is that Arthur Barclay was not dead, <laughs> you know, and, and Gabriel Johnson was not dead. He was, he was, um, you know, but people's lives were being threatened. Yes, yes, yes. And more deaths. I just named a few deaths. More mm -hmm. people died. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The great, one of the greatest African-American to ever explore the interior of Africa, Benjamin Joseph Knight Anderson was murdered around this time for speaking against it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. People are dropping dead all over the place. Mm -hmm. And what normally happens with Africans, as you know from your studies, is that it doesn't take much mm -hmm. to arouse the spirit of cowardice among our people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You make a few examples, and everyone else falls in line, unfortunately. So it's not that there was not resistance, it's that there was not enough resistance. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, there was so much effort mm -hmm. to discredit Garvey, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to justify what was being done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was so much effort also at the time mm -hmm. uh, with these, uh, because you remember they used a lot of these missionaries and church groups to go in as well. Yes, yes, yes. To soften the ground before this even happened. So they've also convinced most of the indigenous population that if you look like the Jesus that they portrayed, mm -hmm. you're a good person mm -hmm. and you should be obeyed and you're godlike. <laughs> you know, so the confusion mm -hmm. they did, the, you know, before you can come in and even do something like this, I forgot to mention this. You have to have these missionaries come in and mind bend the people so that they even think that it's OK. Understood. Yeah, and President King himself was a, a product of missionary education. One hundred percent. All right, sis. So, like, from that time now, I'm, I, I want to want to get some specific um, historical events at some point, right? But just talk about okay. the um, f before we do that. Just just give our our listeners an idea of the kinds of wealth that Firestone was extracting from Liberia. Absolutely. So the United States, um, I don't know if you've heard the term roaring 20s. Mm -hmm. 
mm. and all of this. But mm. the United States, rubber was one of the most valuable raw materials mm. for the advancement of the industrial world. Right. War machines, agricultural machines, right? Rubber was the binder for the equipment that was used for war. Mm -hmm. Modern mechanized agriculture relied on rubber, the tires for the tractors. These are no longer iron plows. We are now the automobile industry. Mm -hmm. The United States highway system mm -hmm. owes itself directly to Firestone because these highways were built for both war moving warrior machines and agriculture, all of which needed rubber, the Interstate 80, Interstate 95, Interstate 75, Interstate 35, all of these great interstates across the United States. Mm -hmm. This wonderful road network mm -hmm. that the whole world looks at and says, wow, yeah. thousands and thousands and thousands of miles of road where the rubber hits the road, when you hear Americans say this, they don't care about where the rubber came from or how it came to be. Mm -hmm. When African people hear the term, the rubber hits the road, and this great American highway system that was created in the 1930s, 40s, mm -hmm. they must remember the bare hands of African people mm -hmm. that cleared the rainforest for this plantation to produce this rubber that fueled the United States military, mm -hmm. this rubber that also supplied the agricultural industry. Mm -hmm. Today, if you want to cross Canada, mm -hmm. if you want to go from, uh, let's say, Toronto to Vancouver, you will enter the United States and take a highway if you're going by road. It's because Canada didn't have the benefit of enslaving a country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Serious thing. Um, just just to add, one one of the greatest beneficiaries of of Firestone's exploits was 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 Henry Ford, um, of course. You know of the of the Ford Motor Company, and it, and in fact their, their families are well uh, intertwined today, well yes. well into each other, <laughs> yeah, and and rich and wealthy uh, off of the exploitation of African labor, in particularly um, in Liberia. Are you are you able to put any any figures on on on, on any of this as far as Firestone is concerned? I, I, um, exact figures as far as how much wealth they extracted. Yes. This is something I actually attempted to do um, for another presentation, and it is very difficult right. uh, to do because you can talk of it, if you look at only what Firestone considers to be its profits, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it is not a total culmination of everything. Right, right, right. As what you've just discussed. Well, how did Ford Motor benefit? How did the U.S. military benefit? How did all of this happen? Mm -hmm. um, it's an astronomical figure. And I, I'm not one to just pull numbers out of the sky, but it is something that needs to be studied. And it actually takes, it's going to take a lot of coordinated research to really determine that. And I hope that's a project. I would love to work on that project with someone one day, but it is definitely an astronomical figure. Um, if, you, if you're talking about, you know, around, Fifteen billion dollars just in rubber revenue alone. That that doesn't. This is tip of the iceberg. Yes. What else are we looking at? Mm -hmm. You know. So we have to really sit down and see how much and what that means in today's dollars. Mm. And and also it might be worthwhile looking at even if we try and uh, find that figure, what percentage of that figure ended up in the Liberian exchequer for the benefit of Liberian people? Very little. Yeah. And in fact, it is a negative um, sum <laughs> because you cannot. So w when the, 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 the chiefs of the North and Central Territory, at that time, uh, the Northern and Central Territories of Liberia had various leaders that got together when, when this whole thing was going on and they went and said, listen, we are going to starve. We don't have enough food mm -hmm. because it has been almost two years. Our people have not been farming. Right. They have been in the rainforest. Mm -hmm. There's going to be mass starvation. Mm -hmm. Firestone responded, don't worry, we'll bring rice from South Carolina, from coastal Georgia. Mm -hmm. 
So when the ships would return, they take the rubber on these ships to the ports here. And upon the return, they pick up rice mm -hmm. and they pay people in rice. <laughs> and you know who was farming the rice? Descendants of Liberia and Sierra Leone, right? Yeah. So <laughs> you bring in the rice from the Carolinas. It's, it's our cousins that they took away, you know, whatever. And they're sending us rice. And this is how they're compensating people. Yes, yes. And so Liberia then becomes dependent to this day mm. on rice that comes through the port mm -hmm. to this day. Mm -hmm. Interesting, you know, you, you said that. And just to put again, to, to, to uh, expand upon what you just mentioned in terms of who was farming the rice, the Carolinas is a very stronghold for a very powerful African population who were subjected at this point to what is called sharecropping in the United yeah. States. Whereby they were growing crops but weren't receiving any of the benefits, yeah, for the produce, yeah. Um, and there's there's a whole history in terms of rice farming in the Americas and how that is even a product of Africans who were enslaved in 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 the Americas in the first place, anyway. But let's, for the sake of time, we're, we're, we're going to try and bring it up to, to today, yeah. Just just give an, uh, our listeners an idea of the influence that Firestone has begins to develop over the politics in Liberia, yes? And we know that at, at different points, I mean, I think even in the 1920s, they, they attempted to uh, basically get some kind of a representative in the Liberian government, yeah? But... Yeah. Got, so, yeah. so basically, by the time Tudman, yes. my favorite dictator, <laughs> the, 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 I always, uh, Tudman, Tudman was a dictator. And I, I alluded earlier to Dubois saying that they were trying to... A time period for, 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 for Tubman. So Tubman, so Firestone, you're talking 1926. By 1943, mm -hmm. the grandson of the great Elijah Johnson, I'm sorry, not the grandson of Elijah Johnson, I'm sorry, uh, the nephew of Arthur Barkley, Edwin Barkley, was president up until 1943. Liberia had not fully been incorporated by the United States. It is the president that comes after Edwin Barclay that finally puts the final nail in the coffin of our economic sovereignty. Okay. So Charles E.B. King did a lot of damage, yeah. but the Liberians were able to pull themselves together and bring Edwin Barclay in. Right. Arthur Barclay from Barbados, his nephew who was born in Liberian soil, he comes in and he essentially saves the state. He saves the republic. Mm -hmm. Edwin Barclay comes in and he's like, listen, get back to work, get back in the farms. You know, he, he's, he's making people angry. So you have them saying, you know what, maybe maybe uh, Hoover was right. Maybe we do need to install a dictator in Liberia. Okay. So 1944, 1944, when Edwin Barclay leaves office, he's literally replaced by a hand-picked man, mm -hmm. brilliant, but... And I, I'll talk about this a little bit because I, I, I read a lot about their, their own, in their own words, their own thoughts. So Tudman was not a stupid man. He just believed things in a way that I don't agree with. In Tudman's mind, it is better to dance with the devil, give and take, and avoid completely being wiped off the map and completely you know, annexed by another country. Mm -hmm. So in Tudman's mind, his thinking was in 1944 when he's installed, and I, I have so much evidence that he was installed by the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. When Tudman was installed as president of Liberia, president for life, which is what he became, mm -hmm. the idea was he would protect the American economic interest. Mm -hmm. And he would do away with all of these Edwin Barclays and all of these remnants of these 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 uppity Africans who thought they had the nerve to look to be self-determinant human beings like all other human beings in the world, you know. So the idea was Tudman would walk that fine line. And what does Tudman do for his people in return? He gets some development projects. He's able to do a lot of things. Liberia starts using the U.S. dollar in 1944. Liberia still uses the U.S. dollar to this, to this day. Uh, Liberia then opens up this 
process of, of concessions. So it's not only Firestone, now you have other concessions that are modeled similar to Firestone, uh, mining concessions and other things. So he comes in with this idea of what he called an open door policy, which basically meant opening the door for exploitation and annexation. Mm -hmm. Most Liberians think this is a positive thing. Mm -hmm. Because if you go back to the 1860s, you have President Daniel Bashir Warner, who put in a protection clause to protect Liberians' uh, economic interests. Right. Tubman removed that clause, which now means it was perfectly legal for all of these people to come in. Mm -hmm. They still can't own land, but they can certainly control the resources in, under the land, under the ground. Yes, yes, yes. So this is, this is what happened. It was 1944. From 1944 all the way until 1972, Tudman was president. No, I'm sorry. Is it 71 or 72 that he that he that he came out? I thought it was 70. 70, 71. Sorry, 71. Yeah. All right, cool, cool, cool. So so that's a that's a large chunk of time, kings and queens. Yeah, let's bear that in mind. It's American, and this is this is the land that it, it believes in democracy and short terms of presidencies and so on and so forth. At the same time as they were the, um, sustaining uh Tubman in in in, in Liberia. They began to sustain Mobutu in the Congo, yeah, in 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 the nineteen sixties, right up until nineteen ninety seven, right. You know so it, yeah. I want to point out, brother, that Tudman Tudman is Mobutu's predecessor. <laughs> this well, is nineteen forty four, and yes. they model even what they're doing today off of Tudman. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Every the, the 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 quintessential African puppet, you know, leader mm -hmm. is modeled after. What happened in Liberia in 1944? Mm -hmm. 100%. Sis. That, that's, that's exactly the point I was making, right? So we're talking mm -hmm. about uh, a, a, a template that is being set for basically neocolonialism. Yeah, this, this is prior to even the rest of the African nations who are under standard colonialism. Actually, exactly. Actually be, be, being able to um, offload the colonial uh, regimes. Yeah. And so we, we see that there's already a stronghold there for the American government in particular. Absolutely. Yes. Give them now, instead of actually having them have actual self-rule, we'll put in puppet regimes. Before this period, Liberia was self-governed. Yes. Mm -hmm. As as poor and struggling as it was, it was self-governed. At this point, it, it now becomes a puppet regime. Mm. Mm. Not That's to take away from, yeah, it, it's a little more complicated than that. This is very simplistic. Pugman, was like I said, he was not an idiot. Mm -hmm. He did he did feel in his own words that what he was doing was preserving the state for the future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He believed that as long as Liberia still maintained its land sovereignty, yes, yes. and he could get the entire country to have access to education as a as kind of a barter thing. Well, I had attractive resources, but we need to build schools everywhere. Tubman was a school builder. So much of the literacy you see in Liberia is because of Tubman. Barclay had started it. He didn't have the resources. Tubman was able to get the resources to build hospitals and schools all over the country. Mm -hmm. He thought that this would position future generations to be able to do better. Yes. But the problem is who's doing the educating and what is the curriculum? Right. 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 Un understood, sister. Um, hold, hold, hold tight, sister. We're going to um, interact with our with um, brother leader okay. shortly. Um, what, what, sorry, go ahead. But just to say, kings and queens, we're, we're at a critical po point in, in history here because we're going into the time of, of William Tolbert um, and Samuel Doe, yeah. and, and, and things get things get things get serious. Yeah. Um, yes. Oh, they're already serious. They're already yeah, but they get right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, we have to we have to we have to you know we have to we have to deal with that, and then that, I guess we're gonna open up the lines. And I know I know brother leader. Is also very passionate about that particular aspect of the history as well. So um, I don't know if I don't know if Brother Leader has anything to say at this point. If not, we'll continue with our sister. But go ahead, Brother Leader, if you have a, a contribution at this point. Um, Tenda Um, it, yeah, you can give me a couple of minutes. Um, we can carry on with our sister for a couple of minutes, and then and then bring me in if you do have a couple more questions for our sister. No problem. Can, can, can you hear Brother Leader good, um, sister? I, I, I can very very well. Thank you. Okay, all right. I was going to say I can hear sometimes your voice, uh, Brother Shakara, uh, seems to dip a little bit. 
Right. Oh, okay. I, that's probably because I'm 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 um so uh, enthralled by our sister's pronouncement that I'm <laughs> leaning. <laughs> Stick to the mic. Yeah, you know, so yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna make sure I stay Remember close, who... close to the mic. Harvey, you always come back to the come, mic. Come back to the mic, come back to the mic, come back to the mic. All right. So apologies, brother leader. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to you in a second. So yes, okay. my sister. So is that are there before we move on to, to Toba and Doe, is, are there any particular points that relate specifically to Firestone under um Tubman. Tubman's uh, premiership that we need to point yes. out? Yes. Yeah. So, so when Firestone first started, the work conditions were basically slave conditions. Yes. Tudman comes in in the 1940s, and I, I, I did skip something. The reason Tudman, why Tudman is a dictator, he was actually uh, at one point an associate justice for the Liberian Supreme Court, and then he became a private attorney for Firestone. Right. Mm -hmm. So he was a, you know, he was an attorney for Firestone negotiating on behalf of Firestone. Why was a Liberian attorney doing this? Because Liberian law does not permit foreigners to practice law in the country. Mm -hmm. White people cannot be in the courtrooms practicing law in Liberia to this day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so these laws are very protectionist. So they had to use a Liberian lawyer to even negotiate the contract. And Tudman was their lawyer. Mm -hmm. Now, Tudman came in and negotiated for better living conditions, he made Firestone build schools and housing for their workers. Mm -hmm. Firestone made sure that the workers were being paid and compensated mm -hmm. with actual money and not just rice. Mm -hmm. Because you know how they had the, the sharecropping in the United States where they had the same system in Firestone. Okay, you got sick, you got injured, you went to the hospital, you owe us this much. Mm -hmm. So everybody was always working in a deficit. They always created a situation where you couldn't leave mm -hmm. because you always owed Firestone. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Tudman came in and put in, you know, negotiated for this not to, you know, for it not to be this type of situation, for it to be actual employment, mm -hmm. where people were being compensated and they could resign and go and be free to go. It sounds so ridiculous because we're talking about the 20th century, right? Yeah. But that that was that was the reality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so you'll hear a lot of people who admire mm -hmm. Tudman and say, you know, he didn't have any choice, but look at what he was able to do. Right, I understand. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it is what it is. But yeah. this this is what happened. Un un understood, sister. So Tudman uh, goes on to 1971. Then we are at the point of William Talbert, yeah, um, and going into Samuel Dole. It's a very pivotal and complex era um, in yeah. Liberian history. So before yeah. we get to the specifics of Firestone, just uh, give our our listeners an idea of, of the significance. Let's begin with Talbert's uh, presidency. Uh, what so I, I do have, yeah, I do have to say Firestone completely destroyed the Liberian economy. Right. Before Talbert, Talbert was vice president to Tubman. Mm -hmm. He was he was Tubman's last vice president. And so he naturally, when the president died, took over. Mm -hmm. So his first uh, term, being the son, the, the grandson of people who were economically viable before Firestone took over the country, mm -hmm. Talbert and his brothers and the people of his generation understood what it meant to create corporations and trade and, and be self-determinant. So they still had this spirit of African self-determination. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Tubman's vice president is not a hand-picked leader by the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. Tubman's vice president is a Liberian. <laughs> he comes in there and he's like, now he's president. Remember what I told you all about when the, the leader, our culture in Liberia, whoever the leader is, that's who everyone mm -hmm. follows. Yeah. Nobody knew Talbert's mind until he became president. <laughs> right. Right. Mm -hmm. Everyone just felt like he was tough. You know, what is he going to do? Go argue with Tubman? He can't do that. So Talbert, when he's now the president, now we know his ideology. Now we know who he actually is. Yeah. He's not a, 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 a second Tubman. Mm -hmm. He's more like Edwin Barkley. Oh. He's more like Daniel Edward Howard. Yeah. 
and his his radical brother, right? Talbert's brother was a a, a radical Africanist. This, you know, so you got these guys that come in now, and they're doing all of these profound, making these profound changes. Liberia's fisheries should be controlled by Liberians. Liberia starts manufacturing. But what was the most dangerous thing he did that was in the front of Firestone? Mm. Liberians should start now controlling and exporting their own rubber. They don't have to sell the rubber to Firestone anymore. Mm. Sell your own rubber directly. since Because all of the farms had turned into rubber plantations. So, oh, you, you used to have a coffee or a tobacco plantation up to the St. Paul River. You now can grow coffee, I mean, rubber and sell it to Firestone. Well, mm. Talbert was like, you don't have to sell your rubber to Firestone. Mm. find fair market value for your goods. Mm -hmm. So he tried to diversify the economy and turn Liberia away from being a plantation state. Yep. yep. And not only did he do that, he reached out to other African countries. Okay. Guinea, mm -hmm. Ivory Coast, Ghana, Somalia. We, until very recently, had Somalia drive in Liberia. The Somalian president comes to Liberia. Talbert goes to Somalia. Yeah. They they organize a trade agreement. Mm -hmm. There was a, the Europeans had signed a uh, trade arrangement with Pacific Islanders and African countries, newly, and in Caribbean countries as well. Mm -hmm. And it was a, an exploit, it was a, basically it was a predatory arrangement. Mm -hmm. Talbert calls everyone in to Liberia. So let's have a conference on this. We're either going to change these terms or we're going to completely reject it. Mm. Talbert calls out the United States of America at the UN and says, hey, you are violating the agreements we had. You're supposed to have sanctions against the apartheid regime, but you're still trading with South Africa. South Africa, yeah. Mm -hmm. Talbert comes in, defense a couture mm. against Portugal. Mm -hmm. Secretary of Guinea. Whatever. Of Guinea. I mean, it is another time. It's like the reviving of the Liberian spirit for a, a, a brief period. Mm -hmm. So it's history from 1847 yeah, yeah, yeah. to about 1920s, the, to the mid 1920s, was this consistent resistance upon resistance, mm -hmm. jumping over hurdle upon hurdle. And it was kind of stalled. You had a period where, where Edwin Barclay comes in tries to re reignite the flame. Barkley is sidelined. Tugman is brought in. Mm. We think Liberia is dead forever, but Talbert comes with the with the, with the fire. Mm -hmm. Rekindles the fire of, 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 of our people, of our I'm, legacy. I'm I'm made to understand as well that that he he actually tried to um in the renegotiation of contracts, he actually tried to audit um Firestone. Yes, uh, yes. Right? And and get them to to pay is it back taxes because they weren't really paying any, any tax? Um, they were not living up to their, their their agreement. Even during the the Tubman administration, we do have to give some credit to Tubman because when right. Tubman was was doing this, he did also make Firestone renegotiate some of these things from Edwin Barton. I mean, from uh, Charles E. B. King's time. Mm -hmm. But Firestone still continued to abuse mm -hmm. and take advantage of all kinds of loopholes to evade taxes. And also yeah. living up to their their uh, end of the bargain that they had negotiated during the Tudman era. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Talbert then comes in and says, we're going to reinforce this. It's not just on paper. And not only are we going to start enforcing it today, you're going to go back and pay us for the times that you did not hold up your end of the bargain. Yeah. Talbert also challenged Firestone on environmental abuses. Yes. Mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. poisoning of, of, of the waters. Mm -hmm. All kinds of environmental degradation around the, the 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 rubber processing and all of this thing that they were doing. So he was a thorn in Firestone's side as well. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you, my sister. I'm sure our listeners are learning a whole leap. Yeah. So we 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 give thanks here yeah, for your insights and your wisdom. I'm gonna I'm gonna just briefly come back. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Not just gonna say because. We don't often hear a lot of talk about um, William Tolbert, so it's good that Assistant is really breaking down some of the things that he did, yes, yes. because his name doesn't doesn't generally crop up a, a 
whole leap. Yeah. Um, yeah. So well, it, I, the first time I, I remember hearing this particular breakdown, and by the way, I should we should just uh, say that uh, Toba is eventually assassinated. Yeah. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Is it so, some of some of the things that happened. So before in 1976, uh, between 1972 and 1976, Tolbert was giving citizenship to South Africans and other Africans from places like what was called Rhodesia at the time, yeah. giving them Liberian citizenship. The frontline states. Yes. Giving citizenship to African Americans like Nina Simone. Anyone who want to come to Liberia? Because that's why it was established. So this is not something new. Yeah, but it's the spirit of UNIA, right? This is the spirit of the Liberian Republic. This is why it was established as an asylum for African people. Mm -hmm. So the United States government, through their USAID, leads a cause yeah. to rewrite the Liberia immigration laws. So for the first time in Liberian history, in 1976, they create these ridiculous laws that contradicted the Constitution, which said that. If your father was not born in Liberia, you can't be a Liberian, even if you're black. Where before that, the only requirement was that you be Negro. Mm -hmm. So if your father wasn't born in Liberia, you're not a Liberian. Mm -hmm. To try to prevent this man, I mean, Mary McCabe held Liberian citizenship. Everyone that was in exile from South Africa could go to Liberia and get Liberian citizenship mm -hmm. under Calvert, under mm -hmm. our constitution. The Catawba is not responsible for the Constitution. He just understood what the country was and encouraged people to come. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And so the U USAID sponsors this law. Mm -hmm. The late Dr. Uh, uh, Amos Claudius Sawyer, Gloria Musu Scott, all of these people. Gloria Musu Scott's still alive. Some of these people went and worked on this thing. Yeah. They worked on this ridiculous law, changing the intent of the country. So there were so many things that were happening, sabotage. Mm. The United States government then starts to do the unthinkable. They take the resources and start pumping it into Bacchus Matthews, Gabriel Bacchus Matthews, and all these people that Liberians think are heroes. They call them progressives. I call them regressives. <laughs> they start spicing up this native Congo war thing, nonsense. They start spreading propaganda about the uh, miracle Liberians who have come and oppressed the native people. And we need re revolution to overthrow these, these foreigners that have been sitting on top of our necks. Mm -hmm. I am a native child of the soil. This is a lie. Mm -hmm. If not for Liberia, I would be speaking French. I'd be colonized by G the French. I'd be in Guinea. If not for Liberia, many Liberians would be Sierra Leoneans. If not for the Republic, it would have been Britain or France. Mm -hmm. If not for the Republic, our people wouldn't own every inch of their land. Mm -hmm. It is a lie. The narrative that they spin about Liberia is an intentional and deliberate lie. Mm -hmm. Gabriel Barkis Matthews, these guys are very much responsible for this propaganda, this hate narrative that they spun to destabilize the country. They tried to get so many people to kill Talbert. They refused. Mm. His own cabinet ministers, the ones who refused to kill him, ended up on a pole after he was assassinated, and they too were assassinated. Mm. The ones who stood by him and said, when they killed Talbert, which was an absolute CIA operation, I have absolutely no doubt in my mind, just like what was done to Thomas Sankara, Patrice Lumumba, this was a CIA hit. And when they killed Talbert, there were still men in Liberia that said, our vice president is supposed to be president if our president dies. And the US government recognized a military sergeant that they put in office against our constitution. There's no constitutional provision for coups and revolutions in Liberia. It was not even our first coup. They killed They killed uh, uh, James uh, um, E.J. Roy, Edward James Roy. But the vice president took over. This is the first time in the history of Liberia for a president to be killed or die, and the vice president is not allowed to take the country. 
take possession of leadership. Right. And the United States government instantly recognizes Samuel Doe as a president. Mm. And Doe marches those men who refuse to recognize this coup, strings them up on poles and pretends to be killing them for acts of corruption. Mm. Hmm. So and now the United States has another puppet in office. This time, the puppet is not educated. Mm. At least Tugman was educated. Yeah. Mm. This yeah. time, the puppet isn't interested in building schools or doing anything like that. Mm. Mm. All right. We're, 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 we're going to come back to this. And, um, People are going to get bad at this show, but it's the truth. <laughs> let's, let's, let's bring it. And, and even in the truth that you're bringing, there's so much more. It's a very, it's a very complex history. Go, go ahead. Just do quickly, Sister, but you mentioned that the role of USAID in terms of changing the Constitution. But no, not the Constitution. It was the Citizenship and Naturalization Laws of 1976. So they didn't shift the Constitution. Yeah. They just wrote unconstitutional laws. Apologies, yeah, just the citizenship. But in USAID, just another CIA um, project? Of course, I, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it's obvious. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. The Millennium Challenge Corporation, I mean, what else? <laughs> like everything, that's what the, all the same. 100%. But I'm just going to bring in brother, brother Lee. So feel free to have a sip of water, sister, you know what I'm saying, uh, for now. But it's, it's, it's beautiful. And we're, we're going to have to come back to a lot of this history because we're, we're we're crossing a lot of different um yeah areas. yeah but it's necessary for this particular show but that's something we're, we're we let me just quickly go to the tech system and brothers i mean i haven't got many in 07947479219 a couple from brother kwame abaja give thanks brother kwame kingdom queen firestone was making so much money in liberia because liberia unfortunately was colonized by uncle sam i'm not surprised that sellout web du bois was using his devious tricks against garvey he also says william tubman was a goon for uncle sam and he messed up Liberia big time. Tubman was more Negro than African. That's Brother Kwame. Abaje says that. Listen, brothers, you can have your say via text. At the moment, line's not open yet. 07947 479219. Text or WhatsApp. Actually, um, another text has come in right now from 830 and says, Greetings, my beautiful sister, teaching me facts about rubber plantation. Give thanks, uh, 830. Tenamwari, uh, Kings and Queens. Brother Lida, are you with us? Tenamwari, I'm I, I, very I, I much with us. I do want to say that um, I, I, I understand why <laughs> the, the texts are slow this evening because I, I feel like the sister is breaking it down. Uh, so and, much. You know what I'm saying? And that, that happens. You know, I, I've, learned, I've learned to gauge and sense the audience. And every now and then, people just want to listen. They know, they know who I talk. That's why I'm taking information. Um, and so I, I get that this is why, going to be why I know shows. And um, sorry. Just to be clear, because I think Liberia is oftentimes, and even what some things history has said made it clear, a very neglected area of our history, of our history. history. Yes. So I yes. think it's important why this is breaking down because a lot of us just don't know and don't hear it regularly. Right. We often go to other parts of West Africa. Right. East Africa, Southern yeah. Africa. Yeah. But like we don't often often Talk focus on stuff. It's very important what we're getting from yeah. our sister this and evening. I, and I, I soon reached there. I've, I've I've been next door to Sierra Leone. Um but I, I, I oh. <laughs> so so yeah, all right, brother leader. Yes, ten day right, right. well, any, well giving to chance contribute and... to the, the beautiful, fantastic and powerful information. Um and in some ways this heart wrenching information that our system yeah. is breaking down. Well, yeah, well, first of all, I'll give thanks and praises uh, to the Creator and the ancestors for the blessing that we've been bestowed with this evening in terms of the information and the insight and the analysis that we have been given by our dearly, our dear beloved sister, uh, giving us a, a better understanding of a very important aspect of Papa Garvey's um, grand legacy of his black print uh, for our liberation and of course as always with you unearthing the, the truth and the facts about uh, a history of a ma'afa unleashed on our people and we see where efforts have, efforts where efforts have been made for our people to to restore 
our own sovereignty as a people, mm -hmm. to restore our own right of ownership of our land, of our resources, of our industries. And we see the cruel and vicious wrath of our invaders, our conquerors, our enslavers, our colonizers. And unfortunately, the story of Liberia is, uh, is very much in the same vein because we learn of efforts, ones and ones who came in the history, who tried to do positive things for the upliftment and the empowerment of our people, but then were obstructed by the said vicious and evil force. And when our sister talk about um, William Tubman, that is a subject that you will know is very, very dear to my heart. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say, Brother Leader, sorry, when, when Uncle Tunji was talking, we don't hear a lot about it. The first time I remember hearing about this issue was from you as a child, yeah, uh, breaking it down. Um, and I, I've, I've always recalled that, you know what I'm saying? So, so, so break it down, Brother Leader, go ahead. Yeah, and, and as our sister was speaking, I, I thought of, and, and I would agree 100% that uh, William Tubman, um, was a supreme sellout <laughs> of, of the disgrace to African history. Um, probably probably um, equaled by only by Felix Yufwebwani of, of Ivory Coast, but that's another subject for another time. Mm -hmm. um, but I think of when I when I when I remember William uh, Tubman, I have to be very careful not to, to mix up the two names. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both of them are William, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and the surname start with T. Uh, but when I when I remember him, I remember him with his top hat and tails. He liked to don his top hat and tails, which of course are symbols of European imperialism. And you think of William Talbot, who often we wore a bush jacket. Uh, and wore traditional hat and carried a staff. And he did that deliberately to symbolize that he was restoring and resurrecting African culture, that he was waging, amongst other things, cultural warfare against the European invaders, the European imperialists. Um, you know, and of course, our sister talked about the cruel and vicious death. He was actually literally disemboweled. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, a knife taken to his stomach and his stomach cut mm -hmm. open. Uh, his wife gave evidence in the so-called Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was called subsequently. And she yeah. bore witness that she saw the hand of the assassin, which was a white man's hand. Yeah? She That's gave right. evidence, even though um, as, uh, you know, uh, as cruelly misled as Sam Doe was, and he was, what, 28 years of age, if I remember correctly. Um, he was a young sergeant who was obviously um, manipulated uh, into into um, being the figurehead, because uh, uh, that's all he was, the figurehead uh, in the school. And, um, you know, it was purported that he was the one who actually killed um, William Tubman. But, his, but as I said, sorry, Talbot. William Talbot. But as I said, his wife gave evidence um, to the effect that I suggested, uh, that I said before. And then this one of the, you know, one of the most vicious incidents of, of our history was how the government ministers who refused to go along with this inimical scheme, how were they, they were disposed of uh, on a seafront. Yeah. They were lined up and placed before a firing squad. Was it nine of them, my sister? Yeah, they were actually tied to poles. And yeah, tied yeah poles. that's correct. And, line, and this was, I don't know if it's still on YouTube. 
It is. This was on YouTube for many years. Mm. This assassination was on YouTube for many years. I haven't seen it now for maybe approaching a decade. But it's something I've actually that, that was actually on. Just imagine. This was actually on YouTube for a number of years. Yeah? To, just to show the world how, quote, unquote, savage African people are. When the savagery was really coming from the... United States of America, mm -hmm. yeah, who invited Sam Doe to the USA shortly after, and he came back with, I think it was 500 million, half a billion, I think he came back from the United States um, with, uh, for a job well done. Um, now, I, I, I do want to just raise a, a couple of very quick points that I hope my sister might be able to um, address uh, and perhaps to clear up uh, some contradictions, uh, which is, uh, for example, understanding, as our sister has informed us, that the Liberia project was really a project of Africans returning to our homeland and reclaiming our legacy um, our land, our legacy as, um, as, as African people. Um, one wonders what was the actual role of the American colonization society in, in all of that process, because that society did exist. That society was actively involved in this, um, what for us was a repatriation program, what, what, what for them was clearly an invasion into the into Africa um, for the purpose of colonization and promoting American imperialism. Um, in addition to that, there are some some other glaring some further glaring contradictions. Um, for example, uh, the Liberian capital having uh, been given the name Monrovia from the American president at the time, uh, James Monroe. Uh, the American flag, the flag that, the, that Liberia adopted, being really a replica, almost a replica of the American flag. Um, the name of the dominant party, the dominant party that people like um, Edwin Barclay, Arthur Barclay, um, William Tubman, uh, William Talbert were all members of, uh, was the Whig Party, which really was, again, in, in name, it took the name from the American, the highly conservative American Whig Party, and really was reputed to be a black conservative um, political outfit. Uh, just a couple, a couple more, uh, my sister, if I if, mm -hmm. if, and also, we are aware that uh, Papagavi, uh, one of the first, if not the first, I think it was the first uh, person that he sent to Liberia um, to negotiate uh, with the Liberian government, to make links and to negotiate with the Liberian government in the interest of uh, the UNIA's um, repatriation program. And the, the UNIA, also the UNIA's vision of relocating its headquarters in Liberia and supporting the Liberian nation in agricultural and, and, is, and industrial development. Um, and Eli Garcia wrote a report to um, Papagavi where he stated that he, he was not pleased with the way that the American Liberians were lording it over, uh, I think the term he used was the, na the native uh, Liberians. Indeed, when William, William Talbot uh, came into power, one of the areas of his focus was to uh, create more opportunities for our, I don't like to say indigenous um, Liberians because we're all indigenous, 
um, I don't like to say native because we're all native to the uh, to the motherland, but to the the Liberians who are referred to as the indigenous Liberians, who were sidelined um, over many uh, over many over a long period, a, a very elongated period, um, who were sidelined um, politically and economically experiencing certain comparative disadvantages to the American Liberians. It is an issue that William Tal uh, Talbot sought to, um, to, to address. Let me let me pause there and allow my sister to, to come in. Go, go, go ahead, Sister Carl. Uh, yes, everyone. thank you. So me, now that Robin has put that on the line, let me just um, add to that, that I, I, I'm, I'm also aware of the fact that uh, Martin Delaney in the 1860s uh, traveled to Liberia and he had certain crit criticisms also in terms of particularly in relation to the, the relationship with, like, with the American government uh, at, at, at that time uh, as well. Yeah. So, so very quickly, the I'm very pleased. So, sorry, sorry, my sorry. sister, let me just say very quickly. I'm very pleased that in your opening you made reference to the forerunners to, to Papa Gavi uh, because that is extremely important. Um, Papa Gavi didn't just happen um, in time and space. You are quite right uh, that he uh, he stood on the shoulders of some great ones, some of which have been mentioned, Martin Delaney, um, Edward Wilmot Blyden, John Edward Bruce, um, uh, Henry McNeil Turner, uh, and various others who inspired him. Robert Love, Dr. Robert Love, um, you know, Deuce Muhammad Ali, and, and we could go on and on. So we, you know, we're very pleased that you put that into perspective uh, and really, ch which chimes very well with our understanding and the message that we always put out um, to to our people. Ten Feel free to go ahead, my sister. Address those points. Thank you. First of all, go ahead. Sorry, sorry sister. Sorry. sorry Just sorry, quickly sorry. say, I mean, I don't know if I should say this or not, but the, the executions are still available on YouTube. On YouTube so yeah. yes, they should give some good. But yeah. Yes. It's, I, so, I didn't hear. I didn't hear what you said. I'm sorry. You were saying that the, the executions that were mentioned earlier are very much still available on YouTube. Yes, they are. They are. So they, they have even the, the war that was fought in Liberia was filmed in the highest quality that was available at the time, you know, for their entertainment. Yeah. And the yeah. slaughtering of, of women and children and, you know, this yeah. is all for their entertainment. It was very entertaining for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but to, to talk about Liberia, um, Paul Coffey um, was the one who came up with it was Paul Coffey, mm -hmm. who was who was the one that started to transport African Americans. Um, this is separate from the Sierra Leone Company, uh, for the purpose of establishing their own country. This was not an invention of white America. So the American Colonization Society, these so-called wealthy white philanthropists were also business people. They saw this as a good way to jump in and help this effort of getting rid of these undesirable uppity Negroes who were essentially initially freed Blacks. The other thing I want to clarify is that the U.S. government initially, we, there was a, uh, a moratorium against the, uh, the transatlantic slave trade, but it was still continuing. Mm -hmm. So anytime they were able to rescue these ships, especially in the northern states of the United States, they were able to establish that these people were taken from Africa and they were born free. The U.S. government could not then turn around. In some cases, if they ended up in Savannah in the southern state, they'd be sold into slavery anyway. Yeah. But for the most part, they weren't allowed to be sold into slavery. They had to be living free. Mm -hmm. So one of the misnomers of Liberian history is that the first vessel that went to Liberia had predominantly recaptured Africans on board, not the descendants of African Americans who, who, who were enslaved. Mm -hmm. This is very important. Okay. It is also very important to say that we need to understand that there is a difference between these numerous settlements along the West African coast and what would then become the Republic of Liberia. There were many colonization societies along the Grain Coast. You had the Mississippi Colonization Society, Maryland Colonization Society, ACS created something called the Commonwealth of Liberia. And yes, ACS named the capital Monrovia. The flag, 
the flag of Liberia, we can do a completely different show on that. Um, but th this is not some kind of mimicry of the United States. That Lone Star represents something. Sekou Toure brilliantly put it in one of his speeches as well, that this Lone Star represented a beacon of hope at a time when Africa was in bondage. The symbolism for that flag means something. We have a tendency to see our own history through the eyes of the people who detest us. The very moment Liberia declared its independence, there were indigenous citizens. We have to remember when people say, oh, the indigenous people were sidelined. It gives an impression that my ancestors did not have their own governments and ways of life, as if they were waiting for someone to come and give them westernization and Christianity. This was not the case. When this republic was established, it was established in the midst of sovereign Africans. We are talking about 1847. Africa was not colonized. So nobody sidelined anybody. You're talking about a coastal territory that was controlled and incorporated the people who were existing on the coast. Among the very first citizens, the majority of them were not the descendants of African-Americans, but indigenous. Some of the wealthiest traders and politicians in Liberia were so-called indigenous. This is a fact. James J. Dawson was indigenous. Daniel Edward Howard, indigenous president. Nobody talks about that. Everyone, for most of my life, until I started doing the research myself, I was told many things that were untrue. Mm -hmm. So was there classism? Did Christians discriminate against people who they considered to be pagan? Absolutely. This was not a utopia. This is the 19th century. You know, you had situations where people had their traditional beliefs, and these Christianized Africans were thinking, my God, these people are devil worshipers. Yes, this happened. And if you were living within the, the confines of the controlled territory of Liberia, you had to be behave like a Western person. This is absolutely a fact. Right. That is not the same thing as saying that indigenous people did not conform and participate in the advancement of the Republic. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that everyone who had a Western name Paul Burke spoke Pele because his grandmother was Pele. Pele yeah. There was no apartheid in Liberia. Mm -hmm. These people came in, initially started intermarrying with indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Many of our leaders were Vi, Basa, Grebo, coming from these ethnic groups. James A. Dawson was a Basa man. He spoke Basa, Grebo, and Klau, or crew as we say. So the idea that some group of people were sidelined. It is a social, it is a disinformation campaign, a propaganda campaign against Liberia. They took something and exaggerated and made it so extreme in the hearts and minds of people around the world to remove Liberia from the respectable commentary of African world history. Mm -hmm. Liberia's story is the missing link mm -hmm. and it's not an accident. The other story that is absolutely false, if you go back to primary sources, is this idea of a mulatto hegemony. How all of the first leaders of Liberia were mulatto. This is not true. We have the photographs. <laughs> you had Joseph Jenkins Roberts, who was a, a, son, a biological son of a white man, but raised by a black man, black freeman, Roberts. Jenkins was his uh, a Welsh... Irish father, mm -hmm. and Roberts was an African man. His mother's when his mother was liberated from slavery, she married a black man, and this this man raised Roberts. Roberts' vice president Stephen Allen Benson was a full blooded African. The third president Daniel Bashir Warner, a full blooded African. The fourth president James Friggs Payne, who they paint to look like a white man, we have his photograph, an African. Edward James Roy, 
full-blooded evil. And when Arthur Barclay became president, you had subsequent, after Barclay, his vice president was an indigenous man. He was followed by Daniel Howard, who was indigenous. You didn't have another African-American president until Talbert, I mean, I'm sorry, Tudman. They were, even Charles D.B. King was not an African-American. He was the descendant of recaptured Africans. Mm. Arthur Barclay from Barbados, not African-American. Daniel Edward Howard, Basa, is his ethnic group, so-called indigenous to Liberia. So we have this misinformation or disinformation campaign against the country. So I just wanted to say to the brother, yes, uh, ACS was there. ACS was not the creator of the idea. And the independence of Liberia was the assertion of African people. Um, I would want everyone to uh, reference uh, Hillary Teague's declaration of independence that he wrote when Liberia declared their independence. And that gives you basically the full story uh, of how and why they established themselves. These people were able to read and write and articulate their minds. And we need to tell the story the way they told the story, not the way Europeans have rewritten the story. They wrote the story themselves. Um, and then I think, did I address all, everything the brother said? I'm sorry. Um, I think most of the points were uh, in, in fact addressed and we are actually heading to the, the, the conclusion of the show. Yeah? Okay. So what, just suffice to say that as we've been saying for the entire show, the history of Liberia is entirely complex and there are different points of view and maybe this is, this is a, a call for another show specifically on that topic where we can go through yeah, the history. Yes, of, of course. You know, and, and also the different points of view as well. Do you know what I'm saying? Because like I said, um, there are others who were writing at the time, at different points in time, that had certain critiques and so on and so forth, as we as we have of, of, of all of our nations since then as well. So not only that, because we only reached 1980, right? In in, in, in the rundown <laughs> on Firestone, yeah. So th th there's more to get to, yeah. So, so I mean, if Firestone during the war was still extracting rubber, still you right. know bullets flying, Firestone rubber still leaving, you know, it was it was, it's a horrible it was it's a horrible exploitative relationship. 100%. Sister, before we close the show, though, one thing I do want to get out is that since um, the turn of the century, so to speak, yeah, the year 2000, there has been a number of, um, of attempted uh, lawsuits against Firestone, none of which have, have been successful. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, and so just, just, just to bring it up right up to date, just for, to close the show. Uh, because we and we're not going to be able to go into a lot of the history of the civil war and so on and so forth, etc., uh, or so-called civil war, etc. At the same time, um, just bring it up to date. Let's speak to the, the the recent legacy of those who have been trying to uh, bring Firestone to book, so to speak, and what has happened uh, with that. So it's difficult for a for citizens to sue a company that's in collusion with the government. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so there have been many, many attempts by individuals, uh, workers, by uh, you know advocates, and it's very, very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. what, what would have to happen is Liberia would have to challenge um, the company as, as an entity itself. Yep. And that is very doable. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot that Liberia needs to do. Yeah. I will say the last thing I, I would want to, to add about this is that Firestone owns nothing in Liberia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Firestone owns absolutely nothing in Liberia. Liberia's land, it is the only country on the continent of Africa where every square mile of the land is owned by African people. It is the only country on the continent of Africa mm -hmm. that does not allow anyone who is not African to become a citizen and does not allow anyone who is not a citizen to own land. Mm -hmm. So these concessions can be reversed. There are all of them have exit clauses. Mm -hmm. Every last one of them can be reversed and overturned. Mm -hmm. And it just takes the citizens to have the education and the understanding 
to know what they have and what they're able to do. Mm. Liberia is still, to this day, on paper, the dream of Hillary Teague, Elijah Johnson, Marcus Mosiah Garvey, it is still the vision that it was, that was, it's, it's still a work in process. Mm -hmm. It has not died. Mm -hmm. Though it is a dream deferred, it is still alive. And as long as that clause has remained, the constitution has remained, mm -hmm. it's still what it was intended to be, an asylum for African people. So all of you under the sound of my voice, for our constitution, are Liberians. Give thanks, my sister. Yeah, like I said, there's so much we could go into. And I, if I, I even heard that there were some attempts, you know, under uh, George Weah, who we know very well in the UK, because he used to play football over here. Um, <laughs> um, there, 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 were, there, there has been some attempt to try and change this, this, this clause, as they, they previously did in Haiti, in relation to who can and can't own land and become a citizen in, in Liberia. I have heard something about that. So we're, we're going to have to bring you back at some point, yeah, to even delve into what you just alluded to in terms of what the Liberian government should be doing that it's not doing in relation specifically to Firestone, yeah? Um, and and, and it, would, it would take a lot of courage, yeah. Yeah. Courage that we don't have yet. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so we, we, we hope that some of the, well, let, let's, let's hope that some of the courage among the people of, of West Africa at the moment against France uh, <laughs> into, you know, the, the, the library. Osmosis. <laughs> it comes through kings and queens. Brother Leader. We, we, we've, got, we've got one minute for a closing word. Garvey lives. Garvey lives. Mazaya <laughs> lives. He lives. He lives. He lives. <laughs> Continue to bless and empower our sister in her tremendous work that she's doing for our people. And may the Creator and the ancestors shower blessings and power upon the people of Liberia, indeed the people of Africa. Because notwithstanding our constitution in Liberia, we don't have control over the land ownership but not control ownership of the resources under the earth but not control the industries we do not own and we do not control by and large and the suffering of our people history is there to tell but may we gain strength from the wisdom and knowledge our sister gave us this evening going forward. I close as always in the words of the most eminent prophet and king, His Excellency, Marcus Messiah Garvey. Unite, organize now or perish. Rise, mm -hmm. mighty African people, for you can accomplish whatever you will. Rumbidzo kunamwariye Africa. To the God of Africa be the glory. Ten nine more. God be lives. God be lives. And then my sisters and brothers, this has been Africa Speaks with our Keblin here on the Big G. Join us again next strong between seven and ten p.m. where we talk it straight and make it play next. Time.